So now we're going to skip ahead to item number eight, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, docket number 16-3899, uh, block 872, lot 78. Um, this is an application, uh, a neo-Georgian style building designed by Thompson Homes and Converse and Charles B. Myers and built in 1928 to 29. The application is to construct a rooftop addition, install new storefront infill, signage, and window openings. Um, this is 44 to 48 Union Square East, also known as 100 to 102 East 17th Street, Tammany Hall, individual landmark. And this is the first time this is being presented. It was read into the record November 18th, uh, 2014. Shaw Preservation Staff. 44 Union Square East is an individual landmark located on the southeast corner of Union Square East and East 17th Street. The proposal is for the following. The removal of an existing slate mansard roof and its replacement with a new metal and glass roof competition. The installation of new storefront infill at the ground floor. The installation of new signage, including lettering at the storefront transoms, uh, sign bands above the ground floor, a bracket sign on East 17th Street, and the replacement of four flagpoles at their existing locations. The installation of two new entrances within existing window openings, or expanded modified openings, along East 17th Street, and the installation of a new entrance marquee at one of the new entrances, and the removal of three decorative panels at the third floor of the East 17th Street facade and their replacement with new 12 over 12, over 12 double hung wood windows. Margaret Connor, the owner, will begin the presentation. Check marks for them. Right. Check for them. I'm Margaret Connor. I'm president of Liberty Theaters, which owns and operates theaters in New York City, including the Tammany Hall building. We purchased the building over 15 years ago and was contacted immediately by Landmarks. For the last 13 years, we've been working with Landmarks to, on different ways to make changes to the building. The current configuration of the building um, makes it difficult to pay for itself, so we need to make improvements. As owners of this designated building, we understand that we have certain responsibilities now. Today we are presenting something that we feel will highlight and enhance the landmark qualities of the building, um, which will bring more awareness to its existence and will establish a solid corner of presence on Union Square. So here is Harry Kendall. Thank you, Margaret, and as she said, I'm Harry Kendall of BKSK Architects. Um, I emphasize what Tim and Margaret said is that um, we're replacing this slate roof, but overall taking a building that's quite worn and um, concealed, conceals its architectural merit beneath a lot of um, scrim of aging and signs. And we're proposing to put an unabashedly contemporary dome in place of that slate-hipped roof, at the same time restoring the base to, in, in large part, its former appearance, in, in small part, some interpretive linking of the, the, the modern and the contemporary, both in storefront and, and um, um, rooftop. So um, we'll get deeply into our architectural rationale and some of the precedents we're citing. But first, I'd like at least Quay's part to describe the building's um, existing conditions, its unique history, and the context in which it sits. I'll actually go back to that. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. I'm Elise Quay's part from Higgins Quay's part. Um, this building has a rich political and cultural history, um, only some of which has to do with uh, Tammany Hall, um, which dominated New York City politics in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, it was built in 1927 to 28. Um, its neo-Georgian design was meant as a reminder of the society's origins um, in the pre-revolutionary days 
and as a symbol for the reform-minded uh, Tammany that arose in the early 20th century. We'll hear a lot more about that later um, when, uh, when Harry comes back uh, to, to talk about the building. Um, however, in the 1920s and 30s, with the ascendancy of FDR and the New Deal, um, all of that undermined the influence of the Tammany machine, and it was forced to sell the building um, in 1943 to Local 91 of the ILGWU. Um, they occupied the building for 40 years, um, until 1984. Since that time, um, it has had a number of cultural uses on the upper floors and, uh, and uh, commercial uses on the ground floor. Um, the building has a very broad cultural significance and is the only surviving headquarters building of Tammany Hall. It has uh, historical significance as well. Um, expansion of uh, a landmark building requires considerable thought and um, uh, Margaret and her family and the team have um, had a lot of thought and conversations about this. The issues of context, scale, design, and historical meaning are forces that inform the approach and Harry will in introduce all of these uh, and go into them in, uh, in a lot of depth. Um, I, We'll uh, just point out, you understand that the, the slate roof that is um, uh, mostly obscured by the balustrade on this building um, is uh, proposed to be removed um, in order to uh, install the, the new um, addition. And um, from this uh, very prominent angle, you see that it's uh, has a kind of secondary read. Just wanted to uh, have you focus on that, and we'll uh, see more of that detail in a moment as we go into the existing conditions. Uh, first, the building is located here on Union Square East, and um, it's in the northern half of Union Square, um, where there are a number of individual landmarks. You can see them in your, in your books. The Everett Building, the Century Building is here, the Ladies Mile Historic District comes through here, uh, the Union Building, the Bank of, uh, of the Metropolis, uh, Union Square Savings Bank. So uh, the Guardian, uh, the Germanian Life Building uh, here on the corner right next door. So the northern uh, portion of the square is populated by um, very uh, important and distinguished um, uh, architecture. And um, the, uh, the uh, Tammany Hall building is nestled right in there um, uh, as, as part of that group. Um, the existing conditions, um, you see one historical image right here, there are many of them, um, and you'll see some more as we go through the uh, presentation. Um, we don't have uh, so many at the outset because the building um, is uh, very intact on the upper floors, uh, the limestone uh, and um, uh, keystones, the classical elements are all uh, very much um, in place. Behind this is a um, this banner is a, uh, an iron railing which will be um, retained and restored, as will all the masonry, which will be cleaned, pointed, and repaired as, as necessary. Um, the ground floor um, facing Union Square was uh, very heavily altered in the 1950s um, to create a, a commercial uh, storefront area. Originally, um, the manufacturer's Hanover Bank occupied the ground floor facing, um, facing the square. And as Harry alluded to, while um, much of the masonry has been removed from the ground floor, um, the new installation will, uh, will not restore every element of this original condition, will serve to bring the base of the building back down to the ground, because right now it's floating over some rather unpleasant detritus. Um, on the second, or the 17th Street side, um, we uh, note a, a few places where balusters are missing, they'll be replaced in kind. Um, so a couple of the entries will be um, dropped to, or rather the windows will be dropped to create entries. Um, but uh, on the upper floors, again, restoration for the uh, windows and, um, uh, and the masonry. would like to point out that at the east end, um, on this side, there are three plaques, there are a number of plaques on, on this side. Um, uh, one is uh, Tammany in a rondel here, and another is Columbus. Um, with a, a Tammany slogan in the middle. But the three over here uh, are uh, going to be replaced 
Um, windows will be installed on this end um, so that uh, the space will be, uh, will be more usable. You can see another image of it uh, here as well. Um, the roof, oh, sorry, here's a, the elevation, the existing condition, just to um, give you a little bit more uh, uh, detail. Um, as you'll see, uh, uh, the, the roof shows up more prominently in elevation than it does in reality, but we do see that in the back there are a lot of uh, uh, mechanical uh, sheds, and uh, the roof actually serves to hide uh, the, the mechanicals to a certain degree. Um, and then you can see from above that it's not actually a complete roof. It's more like a, a stage set um, behind which are um, small uh, uh, sheds and um, this uh, space that was um, actually an apartment um, and then open spaces behind. So it's not really a complete roof. Um, so I think that uh, at this point um, I've covered the existing conditions and sort of the overall of what's happening with the base of the historic building, and Harry will take it from here for the, uh, uh, the new edition. Thank you, Elise. I, sh I should mention, and I meant to at the start, this, um, this rooftop addition is as of right for 100 feet, and then it, it represents the expansion of a non-conforming use into a residential district. It already exists as a non-conforming use. We're adding floor area, so there will be a BSA stage that seeks, it, 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 in terms of bulk, it is entirely as a right. It comes nowhere near the allowable FAR. It's not, it's not even remotely approaching that. Um, so, back to the bigger picture. Union Square. This corner was occupied, oddly enough, by a seven-story hotel building before it was torn down in the 1920s and replaced with the three-and-a-half-story um, Tam Tammany Hall. This beautiful picture of Union Square, taken in 1910, shows the Germania Life Building rising behind it, emphasizing the taller quality in the north, of the north wall. I think actually, with the hotel, it kind of gracefully <coughs> steps up to that taller wall, um, but it, it doesn't anymore. And Union Square itself is very beautiful, but it's never been a place known for its quiet decorum. Rather, it's been the site of a lot of um, events, um, large-scale parades, um, um, activity. This is the Centennial Celebration, 1876. This is the World War I recruiting uh, event with a full battleship constructed. And steady as a beat, it's been a very commercially active square. Never knows more so now than before. Um, it's, it's the site of the Green Market, of course, and our building faces directly onto one of the more active parts of the Green Market. We, we call this in-house a sort of zone of quality. The, most of the protected buildings are in this north portion. A lot of the activity is in this north plaza. And here we see a larger image of how it appeared urbanistically before the building was taken down and replaced with this um, three-story building with, with, with the hipped roof. It's a very meritorious building. It has a great deal of architectural interest. It has even more social interest. But um, so this is in no way to de denigrate it. But urbanistically, it allows the corner to leak a bit. It's just it's a little diminutive in that site. Um, we can help. <laughs> and um, it it's also allows a view into a sort of raggedy background that wasn't there originally and can be some, somewhat more hidden now. But that's a very small part of our overall thought. We recognize that you don't justify a sizable addition to an individual landmark just by saying that the context could accommodate a, a, a bit more height, but it can. Um, so, the architecture. Behind the balustrade, um, we are showing a self-supporting glass wall, glass and steel wall, set back approximately 18 feet. Um, that, um, those vertical mullions, uh, at the, at, as it comes close to its arched rooftop branch and become a bit more neo-Gothic in a way. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, um, floating above it is this arched form that resolves itself as a kind of modified dome, and it floats above um, the, the balustrade, um, going side to side, and, and the full length of the building, except for the original 18-foot setback. The, the brow, pokes five feet further back out, so it's a 13-foot setback from the front. 
and it's the, the, this is a column-free structure. It's called a diagrid for a diamond. It, it, it um, gets its stability through these intersection of steel tubes in a diamond pattern. Um, oops. The, the fourth floor is being lowered a bit, so it's, it's 10 feet below the balustrade. The new fifth floor is essentially at the level of the balustrade set back, um, and the sixth floor is set back further and is about, um, actually I'm forgetting, um, 18 feet above the, the fifth floor, 12, 12 feet above the fifth floor. Um, so these three floors, the existing fourth, the setback fifth and the further setback sixth, are interconnected. You can see down from each upper floor to the one below, and they will be occupied by a single tenant. Well, but but that tenant has not been identified. This is a this is a building, and um, our client will be marketing this building once something is approved, and they know what they're marketing. Um, as you go to the back of Union Square, it it, it um, has its most dome-like appearance as you uh, approach back. Closer and closer yet, the dome quality recedes. It, it appears more as an arch over the, the triangular pediment and kind of an echoing secondary pediment form. And as I said before, these the, the vertical mullions become more patterned and give way to the, what you view inside as a, as a coffered ceiling. There is a moment of wonderful grace on the on the front facade in the in the the sort of Pope balcony doors and transom above that. It's the only, this is the only arch on the Union Square facade and it's the only departure from the, um, rec uh, the orthogonal mullion um, character of the windows. It becomes a kind of neo-Gothic fenestration and we, uh, as a sort of grace note, pick up from that um, up above a little bit of tying the two together. But that is, again, a small part of an overall strategy of geometric proportioning. This diagram, which when you make, a, when you propose a dome, you imply a full sphere or circle. And um, in, in this case, the geometry of our dome um, bottoms out at the, the base of the building. Any student of architectural history will say, oh, that reminds me of something. And that something is the, perhaps the most influential building ever built, the, the Pantheon in Rome, in, built by Emperor Hadrian in AD 126. Its perfect geometric circle that is implied by the dome is on the interior. It's meant to represent the perfection of God um, experienced from the worship space inside. One of the best known inspirations from the, from the Pantheon in our country is Thomas Jefferson's um, University of Virginia Rotunda. The subtle difference in these two diagrams, which are very similar, is that the, the rotunda, which um, um, holds down the axial end of the beautiful UVA campus is meant to be experienced from the outside. So its geometric perfection is, is, happens from, from, the, from the exterior. We've gone in, this, in our course of our design deep into the typology of porticos, pediments, domes, lunettes, tambours, attic stories, and we can hardly say that there is no one set proportion like our perfect sphere that governs the relationship of dome and, and base of building. It's, but there are taller domes, there are squatter domes, and we can say a couple generalizations. Domes are meant to be seen, they symbolize something, and that something is inherent in the quality of the building. And um, they, when you do proportional analysis, you find that the, the, the the geometric relationship of the dome to what it sits on is key to the interpreting that building. Um, we also found recurring motifs, um, as I mentioned, porticos and pediments, so often double pediments, often lunettes, often the attic story or what rises above the base is used to gather natural light and flood the interior with it. So we highlight some, some of these elements I will not go into as much depth as I we did in the office, but so back to our original diagram. Our, our dome's spring line happens at the top of the engaged columns. The, it is one half below, one half above, as the circle always implies. And the upper half, which is in large part new, is basically 
one quarter frieze cornice balustrade and three quarters are our new invention. Now, it's easy to demonstrate that, that the elements of Tammany Hall are part of an architecture that often involves um, domes, but it's something that surprised us that we found that often these elements have been combined and then transformed subsequently with a dome. So we see Thomas Jefferson's Monticello house. He built it roughly in this form. He went to France. He um, delved deeper into classical architecture. He came back and he transformed Monticello with a dome over a portico and a pediment. Um, a, a wonderful 19th century stable in England. Um, it was built as a classical, with a highly classical facade, converted to hospital uh, precisely 100 years later. A grand dome was added to accommodate that new uh, program and yoked into the composition as a very happy uh, overall and very transformative composition. Closer to home and into the 21st century, the Smithsonian Institute has a triple dome addition, not visible, visible from the street in this case, but from the public space as experienced inside, the resonance between the Contemporary architecture and the historic architecture is something that we admire very much and feel that we captured some of that quality. Also, we're using the same structural system, the di diagrid. Um, closer yet to home and then back across the Atlantic, changing programs and changing needs often are an occasion for uh, something that visibly rises out of uh, an historic shell and are a way to both plant a flag in, the, in current time and um, honor what, what existed before. Um, in the National Opera in Lyon, um, this is something very much meant to be seen, very much a commentary on the qualities of, of the original building. And then in terms of commentary, there's, I almost, you know, art building pales by comparison in terms of the world issues that this represents, but the Reichstag in Germany is um, uh, a, a resonant example of contemporary architecture in dialogue with historic architecture. And what it does, it achieves a remarkable balance, that again, we admire, of respe respect for the meaning of the original building, yet a recognition that an interpretive opportunity exists and can be seized and can be accepted as a very new composition, yet with a, uh, a, um, a sort of typological appropriateness. So, back to our humble dome. We don't and as I say, I don't mean to um, put us in the category of as important as the political statement that the pre previous building makes, but in fact, Tammany Hall itself is a name rife with connotations, and um, in fact, something that, that we in New York can reflect on. This slide is strangely um, attenuated. These are not our precise proportions, but... Um, so here we're looking down the side street, and we're we're saying um, um, this can be a viable um, dialogue between contemporary and, and historic. Now, so we have to relate to the history of the original building, and we, we, our approach is very straightforwardly interpretive. So, um, interpretive of what, you might ask. Um, the original Tammany Hall is um, purposely modest, and it's interesting that it's so. So we, had, what, what were the designers and their clients thinking? Um, with the benefit of being able to look back, we know that they were quoting Federal Hall, and this side-by-side -side comparison shows that um, the depth, of, the, the depth of inspiration is is real, and they were essentially cloaking themselves in patriotic garb. They were rebranding the name of Tammany Hall because it had risen, it had fallen, and it had risen again. It was, as described in the designation report, at the height of its powers. But it's actually remarkably tepid, even in relationship to Federal Hall. Here's Federal Hall as it holds down its public space with a very prominent roof and a, a grand cupola. They could have, if they were being, let's say, honest with themselves, um, gone more the route of um, the, the um, Massachusetts State House in, by Charles Bullfinch, where Many of the same elements are combined in a different way, but topped all by a glistening dome.
is meant to symbolize civic power or civic nature. Um, and that quality of grandiosity was hardly absent from the original Tammany Hall. Here we have the Tammany headquarters on 14th Street that they sold to Con Ed, moved out of, and built a building on, on the northeast corner of Union Square. It towers above its neighbors. The scale of this has, uh, is hard to appreciate, but this is a, a music hall, a very grand building in its own right, dwarfed by Tammany Hall. And inside was a great domed hall where, among many other things, the 1868 National, Democratic National Convention happened. So this was so sort of their image of themselves before they fell. Then they rose and they built this. We, we call this in-house the sort of plain brown wrapper that they were cloaking their hidden ambition in. And so in a, a straightforward way we're saying we are proposing to allow the roof to rise out of the plain brown wrapper and display a little bit of the history of this ambition. And so insofar as domes represent a bit of ambition. We, we think that adds to the story and understanding of Tammany Hall. Now, we're looking down the side street, and this pediment and this, these arches were the original main entrance of the occupied, the upper floors occupied by Tammany Hall. And one more digression. We are on Union Square. The, um, we are a rectangular building on Union Square. There's a, a history of longitudinal domes that we can reference this as Borromini's Quattro Fontane in, in Rome, but we're also an, an ellipse uh, in a square as is um, Union Square and it has been transformed over the years. The most important point is that this pediment represented the original entrance of Tammany Hall and in, in large part the geometry of our longitudinal dome comes from that point of recognition of the entry and, and evolves from there. This pediment on 17th Street is, in its current state and always has been, a bit marooned, an odd element on, a, on this building um, and that, that sticks up with only sky behind it from the side street view. We can help with that too. Um, and so our dome has a very quiet presence on East 17th Street, but it sort of sidles up and, and rationalizes that arched form of the pediment. Now, that arched pediment, we've come to understand, and was sort of a, an aha moment for us, is um, the only direct reference to the former home of Tammany Hall that was incorporated into the new design in 1928. And in the, the pediment was a statue of a figure who's actually of great historical importance, Chief Tammany of the Lenape tribe, um, who was the namesake of Tammany Hall and in, indeed Tammany societies across the nation. So this is, to remind you, right, this is the original pediment on 14th Street. It had a symbolic um, content that, we, that surprised us and I think would surprise the public. And um, this is the guy who is being honored and still on a, a plaque on, on the building, Chief Tamanen. He Here he is signing a treaty with William Penn, a treaty of peaceful coexistence. He was a revered figure as a Native American who advocated for peaceful coexistence between the colonists and, and the Native Americans. And there were Tammany societies across the nation as far west as Chicago at this point. Ironically, Tammany Hall is the only Tammany society that survived in the 20th century. And even more, sort of with uh, uh, unfortunate irony, um, he was the, it, um, um, it was known more for graft and corruption than for this ethos of peaceful coexistence. So back to Chief Tamanen for a moment. Here he is in a statue in Philadelphia, a very well-known statue, uh, standing atop a, 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 a turtle. Um, the tortoise, or the turtle, is a key Lenape creation myth that the turtle rose from the sea, its shell was covered in mud and created land and ultimately civilization. So it, it is a powerful symbol, we think, of a um, we, we describe the ambition of Tammany Hall as hidden, and the dome recognizes that, the, that you know, making that evident. There's a, a more deeply hidden thing, which is the, um, the presence of the um, Lenape tribe and the um, people who have been, by and large, written out of history, but yet this um, 
a figure who gave his name to something which symbolizes one thing in our culture now, you could symbolize something else. So um, that, that's our, you know, we sort of say it's typologically appropriate, it has precedent, it symbolizes something greater than itself, it tells the story that this building, which is purposely mute, can um, lead everyone to understand. Hi, I'm Todd Poisson, VKSK partner. Uh, this view also shows some of the replacement windows Tim mentioned earlier, 12 over 12 wood, true divided lights, painted to match the historic off-white cream color from the 1920s. Uh, the grid, the, the dome itself is a self-supporting free-form grid shell comprised of fireproof steel tubes wrapped in aluminum with insulated acoustic glass in triangle pattern. The, uh, some of the joints receive strategic extruded fins that guide rainwater and melting snow to the perimeter gutter that's integral to the dome's edges. Uh, the fins also allow window washers to attach lanyard belt lanyards while they're washing the exterior. Uh, the triangle panels of glass are fritted and filmed to different degrees uh, depending uh, per our studies of daytime reflectivity of sun into surrounding buildings and also nighttime luminescence of the transmittance of glowy domes. We don't want to do either of those things. We're not reflecting uh, unwanted light daytime into our neighbors, nor are we glowing unnecessarily during the night. So each panel receives frit and film accordingly. That, that, those studies for reflectivity and transmittance are in the back of the appendix, starting on page 67. The middle, the ground plan of the middle of the park, you're, you're elevated a good 10 feet. Um, so, but even at this elevated viewpoint, uh, we think the dome is still um, relatively deferential. Uh, the dimensions that Harry mentioned, with the, the vertical wall being about 18 feet away from the front facade, it might be a little more understandable looking at this view. Uh, the, the wall itself is concave in plan. The plans are also in the, in the appendix in the back. Uh, from 18 feet, and then they come forward to about 16 feet on either side. Uh, the rim of the leading edge of the, the rim of the dome, where the gutter is, follows that same pattern, um, is forward mostly on the two sides, about uh, 14 feet from the front facade and, and, and overhangs. It ri as it rises, it recedes. Now, the nighttime lighting scheme includes uh, uplighting the limestone elements of the, of the facade, the engaged columns, uh, the coins, the pediment and frieze, and the underside of the soffit of the portico. We're also illuminating the sign van that's been re-established where the manufacturer's trust signage was in 1928 that at least pointed out earlier. So we are very conscious that we are proposing a very modern rooftop. So we're quietly modern on um, the thought. We're yoking old and new together on the storefront uh, in a way to hint at the original configuration of ground floors, windows, and piers. Uh, we're reestablishing the transom line with bronze and bronze frame, large glass panes interrupted by shallow powder-coated steel vitrines where the stone piers were before the 1950s when they were removed. Uh, we are, so that's the transom line that we're re-establishing. We're not gonna recreate the fan lights in the transom nor the divided lights below that. We are recreating this granite base that has been removed for the most part in the center of, of, of the retail base. We're re-establishing that granite base and lowering the windows to that granite base. In other words, not re rebuilding the storefront bulkheads. Uh, we are removing all the signage and banners and, and canopies. We are keep replacing the two flag poles that are on Union Square facade in kind <coughs> with poles that do not have to rely on tying back to the freeze as they currently do. Uh, here's the transom line at the ground floor at the historic line. There's uh, there's three stores, 
three entrances, three accessible entrances, and the display vitrines where the stone piers used to be, and the signage band at the second floor line. When approached from the side, the, stone, the vitrines uh, reveal their depth, much like the stone piers they have uh, or did uh, historically. Um, they sit on the reestablished, recreated granite base. The granite base that exists still, where it does exist still in the building, has been painted either white and or white and black. Um, we're proposing to clean it out. It's actually a pinkish granite that we would replace and match uh, in kind. So we're being quietly modern on the storefront, especially on the Union Square facade where a lot of fabric has been lost and with small moves on the 17th Street side to knit the two facades together. Uh, this is the five arched portals that exist, the historic portals, uh, which will remain with their fan lights. Uh, the transom line from the Union Square facade wraps the first bay of 17th Street at that same level of the fan light base. So it knits, so it starts to uh, stitch the retail corner back into the building. This last fifth portal, the, bed, the, the arch that's most eastward, historically was always different from the other four. It didn't have a door. The others were all doorways. This one always had oddly a, a window uh, because of the theater function behind. Uh, we're proposing to keep that pattern of that bay's otherness by making it a doorway to a lobby, an entry, accessible entry to the lobby for the rooftop functions, but giving it a marquee to shelter it, and the marquee called, it, it, it continues that pattern of being different, but in a different way. Uh, here's the painted base. It's both painted black and white. Uh, we're cleaning it up and replacing it where we need to. Uh, this is left and, and right, west and east. Uh, the three plaques that Elise described are on the third floor on the, on the easternmost portion of the building. Uh, we are proposing to keep the 6 over 6 transom above the service door, but replace the service doors with solid painted doors. We are widening, we're proposing to widen the next bay to, to accommodate a accessible entrance to the office or retail entity that's on that part of the building. Um, and this is the, east, the western detail where Removing the blocked up or partially blocked, either fully blocked up or partially blocked up windows at the western end, and also removing all the canopies and signage that are on this facade as well. Um, here are those signs and canopies we're removing, the painted base and its proposed condition. We're also proposing two blade signs, two small blade signs down at the eastern end of the building and with, a, with the bronze wrapped marquee that we discussed a moment ago. So that's our full presentation. We'll just leave you with that St. Park Avenue view that you've seen before. And, and we didn't make reference to the model, but everyone is welcome to, to visit it. I, mean, I guess we've wheeled around the school on really. Um, it, it, um, we've hiked it up so you can see it easily from a street level, and um, I think it represents the, the, the happy union of the contemporary and the historic as we've been describing. Thank you, Harry. Um, thank you. Uh, questions for the applicant? Are there any? Yes, Roberta. Um, how, do, how does the uh, roof relate to the new roof or relate to the floor levels? So are there two floors under there, or is it one floor? And where is the lowest floor line? So we can go to the section. Go to the section. Uh, in the so the existing fourth floor is being lowered, as Harry said, a few feet. Uh, the fifth floor is at the balustrade level. The sixth floor is here. So it's 12 feet. This is 12 feet floor floor. This is 12 feet floor floor. And then to the top of the dome, it's just shy of 19 feet. To the from top. the? From the sixth floor. From the top floor mm -hmm. to the top of the dome is just shy of 19 feet, matching the height, coincidentally, uh, matching the height, or nearly matching the height, of the existing tank room that's in that roofscape currently. We're rebuilding that tank room to accommodate modern. Here's that large tank room existing. We're enlarging it uh, eastward to accommodate modern 
uh, mechanical equipment. There's a lot of rooftop, noisy rooftop equipment that exists on the roof, and we're solving those big environmental problems by enclosing love in a new structure there. I'm going to go to the sixth floor. It's just, from this plan, you can see we're at the sixth floor level. You see down the fifth floor and the fourth floor below that. Those yep. are the three interconnected floors that I described as to be occupied ultimately by a single tenant. Uh, just as a follow-up to that, um, if I might, um, is, so the, the existing theater space, I know we're not looking at interiors right now, but is the existing theater space remaining? The uh, currently, look, no. Currently, the pro program of the whole building is still in flux, depending on the marketing of the building itself. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, there is a feasibility study to relocate a, a kind of right-sizing of the theater. Um, Margaret could talk more to this, but the current size is kind of the crux of the problem of the current theater, and we may, there's efforts to find a new place for a theater in the building, but the program of the whole building is not known yet. That, right, so is that it three story high theater space will be, uh, the theater will be removed and the floors will continue at their existing levels. Um, across that space. So there's no, at this point, there's no relationship between the program for theater and uh, a, an, a continuously open and vaulted or domed no, space. No, it's, it's meant to be um, desirable commercial space to occupy. Okay, okay. Uh, other questions? Online. Yes, that, Roberta. So does the uh, roof, um, uh, design material go up on the side? Is it vertical or is that a part of a roof back there? Um, you know where the, your, your new room, yeah. Uh, this what is, that? is um, sloping uh -huh. up to the tank room. Might be best. Really the model. The model's very good. Mm -hmm. That's the right. Okay. Yeah, if you can see that. Um, this, actually, it's this way. Germania will get in the way. Uh, <laughs> it's sloping here in the back where you're whatever, uh, turn around. It's not seen from the street, any of this. Okay, uh, any other questions? All right, why don't we take testimony and of course then we'll have a further discussion. Uh, Barbara Zay. Barbara Zay of the Historic Districts Council. After a decades long effort by preservation advocates, Tammany Hall was finally designated an indiv individual landmark in 2013. HDC finds the proposal before the Commission today to be gratuitous both for the lack of an apparent functional justification for the addition and for the extremity of this stylistic gesture, which is a major departure from the building's architectural language. First and foremost, HDC finds the destruction of the building's hipped slate roof to be problematic. This feature was an intentional design component that references Georgian architecture and harkens back to New York City's early civic buildings, such as Federal Hall and Wall Street. The hipped roof complements the facades on both Union Square East and East 17th Street and is quite tall and prominent from many angles and vantage points, especially given the building's visibility at the corner of Union Square. The roof is also prominent in historic photos, including the one in the building's designation report. If the interior program for Tammany Hall necessitates the, the expansion of the building, there is room to build without it completely altering its character and appearance. The hipped roof and a small part of the top floor form a screen around an open court at the center of the building, which is visible in the applicant's aerial images of the existing roofscape. The flat roof at that depressed area is one full story below the top of the hipped roof. Conceivably, one could fill that in with no impact on the appearance from the street. Any proposed expansion should take such options into account, rather than using the building as a base for a shiny new structure. HDC asks that Tammany Hall be respected, not overwhelmed. Concerning the base on the Union Square east side, HDC is happy to see the removal of the present unsympathetic signage, but asks that the applicant consider returning the building to its original rhythm of three window bays flanking the central entrance, as well as restoring the masonry piers. Thank you. 
Thank you. The next speaker is Jack Taylor. I'm Jack Taylor, speaking for the Union Square Community Coalition, a not-for-profit advocacy group founded in 1980. We have always admired this commission's designation reports for their prodigious research and their careful composition. But we have to take issue with a statement in the designation report for the former Tammany Hall. It asserts, and I quote, that the slate-covered hip attic roof is largely screened from view, unquote. On the contrary, from more than one vantage point on the public way, and most prominently from the renowned North Plaza of Union Square, that hipped attic roof is so visible that it defines the contours of the building. To remove it, as this proposal provides, would be to demolish a protected architectural element of the designated structure. Given that the Tammany Hall Political Club deliberately modeled this building on the Georgian-inspired architecture of the old Federal Hall on Wall Street, where George Washington took the oath of office as our nation's first president, and given that the Federal Hall itself had a prominent hip attic roof, that roof is an architectural feature that resounds with history itself on a building, this building, designated barely a year ago. As to the alleged inspiration for the design of this proposal, its tortoise-shaped dome, most casual onlookers would be hard put to connect it with the neo-religious symbol of a Native American tribal chieftain whose name was corrupted to become the word Tammany. Instead, the public would be perplexed by a mammoth structure whose proportions and style are at violent odds with one another. Those of us with long memories, including the Union Square Community Coalition, vividly recall that almost immediately after the designation of the Ladies Mile Historic District in 1989, along came a proposal to construct a mammoth rooftop addition on the old Siegel Cooper department store building, one of the most significant structures in the newly, then newly designated district. But the applicant, correctly sensing a very vocal opposition to the rooftop proposal, withdrew his certificate of appropriateness application just one hour before the commission was considering. I'm, I'm needless, sorry, Mr. Taylor, your time is up. Needless to say, we wish that Tammany Hall applicant had done the same. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Peter Bergmanson. It's actually Peter Benjaminson. Oh, Benjaminson, sorry. It's okay. I, I didn't read the handwriting, sorry. I'm uh, speaking on behalf of the Union Square Community Coalition, but I'm also, uh, I've also taught investigative reporting and political corruption at Binghamton at NYU and Columbia. I wrote the first how-to book ever published in this country on investigative reporting and political corruption. I was a spokesman for the New York City Department of Investigation during the Dinkins administration. And I wrote a book about that, too, called Secret Police Inside the New York City Department of Investigation. So I'm somewhat of an authority on political corruption and investigative reporting. And I'm against this proposal because I think it would stand in the way of what really should be in Tammany Hall as it stands now. And that is a Corruption Fighters Memorial and Study Center and an International Museum of Political Corruption. I've got a lot of support for this proposal. Uh, a colleague of mine, Professor Roeder at the College of St. Rose in Albany, is already moving ahead with an Albany Museum of Political Corruption. Uh, he's got uh, publicity in the New Yorker magazine and numerous newspapers. My proposal has seen publicity in, of all places, 
uh, Abrazagian, a uh, uh, part of the uh, Asiatic Soviet Union, and in the New York Post several years ago. Uh, what we, this is a great place for New York City tourism. It's halfway between the uh, midtown centers of tourism, like the Empire State Building, uh, et cetera, and Greenwich Village. Tour buses could stop at this. People uh, from all over the country could see uh, readouts of the corruption that exists in their cities and towns. Uh, figures could uh, be animated that would indicate what kinds of corruption went on in this building. Tammany Hall, as several speakers have stated, is uh, known and linked with political corruption. And New York is resisting and uh, not getting the great tourism attraction that it should be. Meanwhile, Albany, as it may be in political corruption, is moving ahead of us. Uh, we need to link Albany and New York with a museum of political corruption in this Tammany Hall building. The turtleization of Tammany Hall is only going to stand in the way of a great tourist attraction that New York City needs not only for its own tourist industry, but to compete with the Albany Museum of Political Corruption. Thank you very much. Thank you. Arlene Elner. Arlene Elner. OK, Brian Dunlap. Commissioners, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Brian Dunlap. I'm speaking for myself. Um, I oppose the, uh, the roof modification. Uh, I, I think I've, I've heard basically two arguments in favor of it. Uh, the first is that it's consistent with Tammany Hall over the ages, as it were, Tammany Hall in its various forms. And the second uh, argument that I hear is that it's consistent with larger motives of architectural and historical virtue. Uh, both of those, I think, are, are fundamentally wrong, and uh, I'd like to say a couple of words on that. First of all, um, as we know, and as we've seen a picture of, the, uh, the 14th Street Tammany Hall, the one that was built in 67 uh, or whatever it was, late, late 19th century, uh, had that wonderful statue of Chief Tammany, Tammany on the roof, a uh, marble statue. I don't know whether it had the, uh, the tortoise under his feet. I, I, can't see that in the pictures. But whatever, they decided it was going to be a nice, big, splashy statue of the chief. Uh, that's fine. But then, of course, what happened was in, uh, in the 20s, a new Tammany Hall was built. And as uh, the, New York, uh, the, the real estate record of 1928 said, it, uh, the design was, quote, a dignified architectural treatment, one of the chief motives of which are the severe colonial columns in the centers of in the centers of the Union Square and the 17th Street facade, which recall the days of early American architecture. Yes, well, that's, that's what we have there. Uh, I'd like to suggest that in no way, either in terms of uh, uh, what we know of, of, of the design then and, and what we can understand of the people uh, who were making decisions in 27 and 28 of this century, was there an idea to put a statue of Chief Townman or his pet tortoise, whatever it was, uh, on the building. It was a completely different architectural notion. So the, the, the idea that in some way this, this reflects what the uh, Tammany Hall tradition, specifically so-called, uh, amounts to, I think that's, that's completely off base. Uh, on the other question of the larger architectural and historical uh, motifs or, or themes that are being enunciated, well, I don't think we have to, uh, I mean, I know what the Pantheon looks like, you know what the Pantheon looks like, we've all been there, uh, we know what the University of Virginia looks like, this is, this is not that, this is, this is not that. What we're looking at is, I gather, a transparent, I thought it was plastic at first, but I guess it's, it's not, it's, it's something more, more uh, solid, but a, uh, a transparent, um, blister, really, uh, something that looks a great deal more like, like what you would expect to see in a, uh, in a, if I could just I'm finish. sorry, your time is up. The, you your expect, time is up, you, sir. You would expect to see in the kind of thing where they have year-round tennis playing. You know, fill okay. it with hot air or fill it with cool air. But thank you very much for your attention. Th thank you. 
Christabel. Christabel. Guth. Uh, Christopher Goff for the Society for the Architecture of the City. In 1927, when the New York County Democratic Party moved to build their new clubhouse, they wanted a building that would recall Federal Hall. Practicing in New York then were Delano and Aldridge, Warren and Wetmore, Grosvenor Atterbury, Cass Gilbert, Mott Schmidt, William Bottomley, James Gamble Rogers, Dwight James Baum, and John Russell Pope. The party, however, hired Charles B. Myers, who did a lot of work for the city. In 1985, we interviewed former chairman David Todd, and he recounted what he called a little anecdote about an older Beaux-Arts designer he had known in the 1940s. This man pointed out a building that he said was a very ordinary building, quote, until they put the architecture on it. Todd said, and that, you see, was the state that the Beaux-Arts had come to. It was, well, we make a box, and then we sort of stand back and throw on the ornament, whether it's appropriate, whether it really comes out of the nature of the building, whether it's all of a whole was secondary. It was a circus. The old tradition was just burning itself out in surface ornamentation without the thoughtfulness that had really gone into the earlier buildings in the classical tradition. It can be argued that even a landmark lacking architectural distinction, once designated, should be preserved intact for what it teaches about history. For instance, the Louis Armstrong House has something to tell us about what housing there was for a great American artist like Armstrong in 1943. So now again, we see a move to put some architecture on the Tammany Hall building, and this time, the architecture is a very inventive and rather attractive free-form glass dome. But it seems to crash land on the roof of Tammany Hall like a spaceship from Mars. It is hard to justify that in terms of appropriateness. Thank you. Thank you. James Fryglass. I'm sure I've got that wrong. And Olivia Kaplan. Commission. Uh, my name is James Kaplan. I'm here representing the uh, National Democratic Club and the Manus Midtown Democratic Club. We're the oldest. Manus Midtown Democratic Club is the oldest continuously functioning democratic club in the city. It proudly dates its origin in the Tammany Hall organization, which uh, built this building, as does the National Democratic Club, which is even older. It goes back to Isaiah Reinders in uh, 1834, and was instrumental in the election of James K. Polk. Uh, we spoke previously at the uh, designation hearing on June 25th, and I want to hand up my uh, uh, remarks on that. Uh, and we were, I was actually quite surprised when Jack Taylor called me and said that there was going to be a proposal very substantially to alter the, facade, the roof of the building as well as to destroy the uh, interior uh, uh, auditoriums. Uh, I'm going to focus on the, the history, not the, uh, architect the uh, architectural part. Uh, we violently disagree with Mr. Benjamin as to the legacy of Tammany Hall, as we did at the last hearing. In fact, it was not, uh, many of the speakers at the prior designation hearing spoke about Boss Tweed and corruption. It wasn't Boss Tweed who opened this building. It was a young governor named Franklin Roosevelt. And Roosevelt was continuing the policies of the Democratic Party in the 20s uh, from Al Smith, one of the key figures at the opening. And we, had a pic we have a picture of it in the, our materials, uh, is Al Smith and Jimmy Walker. S one of Smith's key aides was a woman named Frances Perkins. Uh, Mrs. Perkins later went over to work for Go Governor Roosevelt and later became the first Secretary of Labor for all four years, uh, all four terms of the Roosevelt administration. She was responsible for Social Security, the rights of uh, labor, the rights of unions, 
and really basically pulled the country into the upper middle class. We're very proud in the McManus Club that she got her start with Thomas J. McManus in 1910, and it was he who introduced her to the Tammany Hall politicians who brought her to prominence and prominence in the Roosevelt administration. Properly understood, we think this building is a monument not to corruption, but to the New Deal social welfare programs, and the programs to fight economic inequality, which continue to this day. And thus, we think it's a very important historical building, one of the best, one of the most historic in the, in the state. To see it defaced, as we would see it, by a, a vast renovation, both interior, both exterior and interior, uh, we violently oppose. So we then uh, stand with Jack Taylor and with uh, Mr. Benjamin, and other, even though we violently disagree with their political point of view. Uh, therefore, I urge you, do not deface this great historic building. Please, keep Tammany Hall the way it should have been, the way it was, and the way it should be. Thank you. Thank you. Edith, uh, Edith Charlton. I'm speaking today as a um, former chair of the Union Square Community Coalition, and I'm also representing the Gramercy Neighborhood Associates, whose president had to leave about 15 minutes ago. When I first saw this um, picture with the dome on top, it looked as if there had been a design and it was going to be plopped onto the next building whether it related to the building or whether the material even had to be destroyed in this building. Our local uh, town and village op-ed said, um, a former mansard roof to a strange turtle-shaped dome. What I'm, you've heard a lot of great speakers before me. I'm just wondering, we worked very hard to um, designate this building, both organizations, plus some others. What does it mean if a historically designated building can be turned into this a few weeks after it was finally designated? That's a question I'm really wondering about and worrying about. Thank you. Thank you. Alan Lewis. Alan Lewis, Diana Kuruli, Tiruli, My name is Diana Kuruli. I submitted a written statement, but I'll just say quickly, I, I love the imagination of the tortoise roof, but I really think it's inappropriate for this site. And I encourage you to continue to preserve the architecture as it is and to find another place for that marvelous dome, including the chief, if possible. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you. James Kaplan? I think he spoke. OK, all right. Uh, Martin Finio? Uh, OK, uh, I'll call you next. Olivia, I'll call you next. Hi, commissioners. I'm Martin Finio, uh, architect. And I am actually reading a letter uh, written by James Polshek who would much rather read it himself, but he's just broken his leg. Um, and so I fully endorse what's behind this letter, so hopefully this counts as two in favor. Dear members of the Landmarks Preservation Commission, I am writing to enthusiastically support the design modifications to 44 Union Square East, as presented by the firm of BKSK Architects. I have reviewed their scholarly, technically precise, and astonishingly comprehensive documents. I'm also extremely familiar with the Tammany Hall building and its environs. For a number of years, my office was directly across Union Square. Also, the proximity of my residences, first on East 17th Street and later on Washington Square, has, over the years, allowed me to familiarize myself with the precinct and, in particular, the corner of Union Square East and East 17th Street. I believe the addition of the domical form to the original building to be a brilliant formal strategy both urbanistically and architecturally. The perimeter of Union Square has, in recent years, begun to simultaneously deteriorate at ground level and arbitrarily gentrify above. The new design for Tammany Hall does the opposite. 
It restates the elegance of an earlier time by the restoration of the building's dilapidated facades and simultaneously sets a high standard for the future with its appropriately symmetrical west-facing addition. The serendipitous tortoise precedent rationalizes the arcing form and is an effective preservation approach that adds long life and vitality with a landmark quality addition. I hope I have helped in some small way to convince the commission to embrace this superb design that enhances the Tammany Hall building as well as its historic context. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Hurst. My name is Mark Hurst. I'm reading a letter of support from Mr. Barry Benepe, resident of 49 Jane Street, New York City. Mr. Benepe's name may be familiar to you as a co-founder and former director of Green Market, recipient of the inaugural Jane Jacobs Medal for Leadership in Urban Planning, honorary vice president of the Fine Arts Federation of New York, chairman of the town of Saugerties Historic Preservation Commission, and author of Early American Architecture in Ulster County. Barry is sorry not to be here in person, but had a prior commitment with the Saugerties Comprehensive Planning Committee. Dear Chairperson Srinivasan and members of the Landmarks Preservation Commission, the proposed addition to Tammany Hall before you allows the owner to create needed floor area, has been accomplished by sensitively and intelligently building on the hall's unique history, and is actually quite modest within its context. The dome has both historic references and a truly contemporary flair, it is a finely crafted and imaginative response to a difficult challenge. It will present a glorious presence at this corner of Union Square. The singularity of this revived Tammany Hall is apparent in the power and whimsy of the new dome lifted off the roof and presenting itself to Union Square, which is characterized by diverse building styles, from the Venetian Decker building along the west side to the Queen Anne Century Book building on the north to the Mammoth Germania Life Building with its massive mansard roof to the, on the northeast, to the Corinthian capitals of the Union Square Savings Bank along the west side by Henry Bacon, architect for the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., with yet another strong architectural statement. In other words, the square has no unity of style or roof line. Instead, it's an eclectic chorus of somewhat discordant show-offs. The new Tammany Hall follows that tradition in an exuberant, joyful, somewhat playful manner. We all should celebrate this latest arrival. I urge you to approve this design. Barry Benepe. Thank you. Alex Herrera. Hello, I'm Alex Herrera from the New York Landmarks Conservancy, and uh, I'm, I um, will read our statement. <clears throat> um, over the past two years, uh, we were pleased to speak here at the Commission and at the City Council in support of the designation of Tammany Hall as an individual landmark. <clears throat> this handsome building has both architectural and cultural significance and is an anchor of its neighborhood. The 1929 Neo-Georgian style edifice emphasizes balance and symmetry and like other civic buildings of its era, <clears throat> was built to recall the founding days of the Republic. <clears throat> we believe that the proposed rooftop addition is inappropriate for what it takes away and for what it brings to the building. <clears throat> it would necessitate removal of intact historic fabric. The installation of a 30-foot glass dome on this corner building facing Union Square would be highly visible from many vantage points. The existing slate roof is original and part of the architectural composition of the building. <clears throat> the proposed dome would treat the landmark as its base and really become the center of attention. While there have been some appropriate examples presented of glass canopies and domes on other buildings, they have served to enhance rather than overwhelm the landmarks <clears throat> on which they have been added. Uh, if the owners wish to pursue a rooftop addition, we hope the Commission will ask them to return with one that is smaller and more deferential to this individual landmark. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to present the Conservancy's views. Thank you, Alex. Jennifer Falk.
Good afternoon. I am Jennifer Falk. I'm the Executive Director of the Humans Grow Partnership. I want to thank the Commission for this opportunity to testify. I am here to express our support for the vertical expansion, renovation, and facade restoration of the former Tammany Hall headquarters located at 44 Union Square East as envisioned by BKSK Architects. The partnership is a nonprofit organization that was founded over 38 years ago to promote the economic, residential, and cultural vitality of the Union Square 14th Street neighborhood. We are an advocate for the district and provide a wide range of services, including recently investing in the beautification, maintenance, and upgrading of the north end of Union Square Park. We believe that the proposed project will be a wonderful addition to the Union Square neighborhood as it will enhance the east side of the park and create an attractive commercial desti destination with a distinct presence that can be seen from the park's north plaza. We applaud BKSK Architects for their bold design, which complements the history of Union Square as a vital and active contemporary civic space. The removal of the overabundant existing signage um, will greatly improve the overall look of this highly visible historic landmark, and the streamlined signage plan is simple and elegant. The addition of a glass roof dome the glass domed roof provides a contemporary element while honoring the building's colonial revival style. We, um, BKSK Architects is well known to our organization for having comp completed in recent years the delightful Washington Square Park House, a modest building nestled in our sister park to the south of us, and most recently they completed the Jefferson, an architecturally stunning multifamily multi home that was built on a long neglected, neglected vacant lot on the eastern side of the district. Given these projects and their other past works, we are confident that their proposal for the former Tammany Hall headquarters will unify this culturally significant building with the Union Square District and weave together the old and new, yes, being bold, um, through reinterpretation of its historic details. We thank the Commission for their careful consideration of its proposal and urge you to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Olivia Kaplan. My name is Olivia Kaplan, and I'm speaking on behalf of the National Democratic Club, the McManus Midtown Democratic Club, and also on behalf <coughs> of myself as a young historian and scholar of Tammany Hall. Um, I would like to strongly urge the Landmarks to Commission to uphold the oath to protect the city's landmarks and uh, to preserve Tammany Hall and not put the large tortoise shell structure on top of, on top of the roof. Um, I think back to the Tammany leaders, Big Tim Sullivan, uh, among others, and I wonder what they would have thought of this being put on top of Tammany Hall. It's somewhat comic, and I think that, um, <coughs> that one of the reasons that we're here is to discuss the preservation of this very important landmark. And when we talk about preservation, we talk about the spirit of what it means to, to, to maintain a structure that reminds us of the historic significance of what took place there. Specifically, um, we're talking about the democratic government, we're talking about New Deal social and welfare programs, and we're talking about the, uh, to some people, the uh, whatever corruption that took place there and uh, the interactions of governments. And I think that the, the shell will definitely overwhelm the, uh, definitely overwhelms the structure of the, of the building. Um, also, I, I just want to quote what Jackie Kennedy said, what uh, Jackie Kennedy Onassis said when they, did re when they were thinking about putting a, a, a structure on top of Grand Central Station. Uh, right now there's an exhibit, um, there's, there's an excellent exhibit on the creation of uh, the landmarks, uh, the landmark in Grand Central. Um, she was, Jackie Kennedy was one of the leaders of that fight and there's a you know, plaque in her honor on the south side of the entrance which I encourage all of you to read when you pass it. She says, is it not cool to let our city by degrees stripped of all proud monuments until there is nothing left of all her history and beauty to inspire our children? If they are not inspired by the past of our city, where will they find the strength to fight for her future? I'd ask that you 
consider that um, as you make a decision on whether or not to preserve the integrity of the building. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more speakers? Any more speakers? All right, we received uh, a resolution from Community Board 5, and uh, Community Board 5 recommends denial of these applications to install a rooftop addition and alter the facade in this manner at 100 107 East 17th Street, also known as 44 Union Square East. All right. Uh, Harry, would you like to respond to uh, some of the testimony that we received? I, I think I can be pretty brief. I, okay. I, I appreciate everyone's um, opinions, pro and con. I hope our presentation made clear that what we're proposing comes out of deep respect for the building. I guess I'm a little surprised Democratic clubs don't, aren't um, encouraging of this sort of vi vitalizing of the building, which is very received right now. And I think that it, you can have your cake and eat it too. Um, and that's the, the spirit in which we um, directed this design. All right. Uh, uh, and, and yes. One, one other thing. Um, we, we had expected to have a member of the um, Lenape Center read a letter of, of strong support for, for the building. Um, uh, early in the design, we got concerned that we were quoting what was in our own minds uh, um, a creation myth and a symbol of, a, of, of a, um, people for whom the history is very palpable. And so we um, involved them in the design and showed it to them. Um, they, they are enthusiastic in their support, and we have been in discussions with them about the potential for um, a, a, a wall or a plaque or exhibit within the building or without, um, it would make this connection between the, the, the deep history we're referencing and, and um, the, the shape of the dome. So um, we'll be submitting in the record this letter of support, but um, I'm just letting everyone know that it, it is not considered sacrilegious in any way. Okay. Uh, are there qu questions for the applicant? All right. Uh, the no qu yes, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, Michael? I, I did, uh, one question came to mind while the, uh, the section was up there, and there was a discussion about the, the uh, complete demolition of the interior. Without the dome, with the filling in of the auditorium floors, what is the increase of the, the floor area for the applicant? So I don't, I don't have in my mind the figure of the, the theater itself. If you um, roof over the entire fourth floor, which is a very short ceiling height, but if you make, let me increase that a little bit, you get 9,000 additional square feet from the theater plus the partial fourth floor. And then our new fifth and sixth floor is an additional 11,000 square feet. And Thanks. how much is allowed in the district? <clears throat> oh, it, this is a... Um, it, um, it's a 10 FAR zone? No, it's a... Eight? You want to speak to the La Bluff AR? Um, our ten, it's 10 FAR, sorry, 8 FAR in the Union Square. Uh, this is special use district, which is the first 100 feet of the lot. And then the 50 feet, which is in the residential, is, our, is FAR 4. Uh, okay. We're leaving over 20,000 square foot FAR on the table. Okay. And just to clarify, it's um, 70. It's 7,000 square feet to build right. theater. Okay. Um, are there other questions? Do you have questions? Or just, I mean, they'll be able to respond even during our discussion. So, um, all right. Uh, you know, I just want to say a few things. I think, um, I think, it's very intriguing this proposal, and uh, and I appreciate the amount of work and research that's gone into. Uh, trying to make the arguments for the appropriateness of an enlargement on the site. I just want to say from, uh, again, this is not necessarily <coughs> completely related to this, but just as, as an urban planner and designer, I think that the corner of Union Square and particularly this historic building begs for enhancement. If you go to Union Square and you're uh, walking in the northern plaza area, ironically, you actually kind of miss the building. And so I think the idea of someone looking at this building and finding a way to bring it to prominence is uh, a positive thing. Uh, I think that the applicants made some interesting points about why a building with this uh, neo-Georgian style and its own history 
has the ability to perhaps be enlarged. Uh, I know that the commission sometimes, especially in terms of individual designations, may really need to be convinced about the fact that the shape and form may change. And at least in my opinion, I think the studies that they've shown, uh, the fact that this building at its base is actually uh, very beautifully or, uh, you know, um, um, treated uh, and sculpted, but then at the roof level, there seems to have sort of fallen short somewhere. And if it's drawing inspirations from uh, Federal Hall and uh, some of these other sort of classical buildings which have domes on it, uh, I think that idea that perhaps this building can take some height uh, may be appropriate. And similarly, I think in terms of some of the um, analysis they've done and what would be that appropriate um, relationship of any enlargement to its base, I think they've also provided something that uh, perhaps the commission can work with if one uh, accepts the fact that enlargement is in fact appropriate. I think my concerns really are about the fact that some of the historical uh, pieces or shapes and forms at the roof have not been explored, including uh, the idea that you could have a slanted roof uh, similar to the Federal Hall, but maybe higher, that could accommodate more square footage, or the fact that they've shown domes, which are very classical, and that's a form that was not looked at. Uh, instead, I think the idea of going to uh, a, a, an interesting architectural abstraction of um, a turtle uh, is intriguing, but I think is is hard to sort of grasp and um, in a in a sort of a tangible manner. Uh, yeah, Adi, you want to comment? I I think I agree with uh, uh, a lot of your uh, statements. I, the, the first is part of the reason uh, that you don't notice the building when you're there has to do with the existing signage, the general shabbiness of the building. So it's, it's a really positive thing that the building will be restored. And um, actually, rather than m making more of a statement, it seems to kind of give it a little bit more dignity the, and, and to kind of take off all of that shabbiness and to quiet it a bit. Um, th the, the, the points that were made in testimony about uh, the the history of the fabric of the building and specifically the, the roof that exists, I think, are strong. I mean, it, the, the roof or partial roof that in fact exists, but anyway, the, the uh, reference to roof, to the hip roof of the federal would have been, and, and a taller one, would have made more sense if the need really is to, to get more kind of vertical height there. And, and, I, and I'm not really clear on why that wasn't, that wasn't explored. I mean, other than the fact that you've wanted to do an interpretation. I'm, uh, I'm in favor of interpretations generally. But really, if we take it step by step and want to honor the, the, the history and the fabric of this building, that would not have been, yours would not have been the first um, the first take at that interpretation or in a sort of development. The, the next thing is that I actually have argument with, with your calling this a dome. It, I mean, it is domed, <laughs> but it's, it's not a dome and, and, and fails on lots of uh, levels uh, around that. And, and I recognize that, that's, that, that dealing with a rectangular figure and a vault and dome is a, is a tough thing. Borromini's building is not the dome, the domed space is actually not seen from the exterior at all. I mean, the brilliance of the Baroque is that it, it collapses in on itself, uh, and so we don't see it. The, the example that you cite in the Smithsonian, that, um, the, the figure of that, of that plane is actually res, recedes and, and recessed a lot from the exterior. Almost, you actually don't see it on the exterior. It's a plane that rests but falls and sits uh, uh, to make an interior space, which is very powerful, uh, but isn't visible from the outside. So that, that would have been another approach. And, and I think your um, studies of domes uh, and applied to this, to this shape in all of your elevations seem a little bit off as well. I mean, even the, the figure of the, of, the, of the circle in elevation is too, is too big uh, 
on this elevation. In other words, if, if you look at, at so many other domed buildings, federal, Georgian, others, the, the part, the circle is actually push, is actually smaller on the face of the square uh, facade. So, so uh, th those are perhaps things that can be tweaked. But I mean, so all the way along the line, I feel as though there, there are sort of misses. Um, I, I, I'll just stop there. Yeah. Okay. Yes, John. Um, at the risk of being characterized as a dinosaur in the land of the tortoise, yeah. I'm, um, I'm, I'm very happy to consider the quietly modern changes that um, they are proposing for this building, but I don't think they can allow us to ignore um, what seems to me to be a loudly modern um, change at the roof level. Um, it's dramatic, um, and we do have to keep in mind uh, that this is an individual landmark. We're not talking about uh, compatibility with the historic nature of a district. We're talking about a particular building that's been chosen for a particular purpose. The change at the roof line is visible in, in, in many, many, many places. Um, it is destructive to the original uh, material um, that is at the um, roof level now. Uh, that doesn't mean that I would be opposed to something being added to the roof of this building, um, but I just don't think that this is it. Um, and I am dying to make a gratuitous comment about whether a museum for corruption is appropriate in Albany, but I won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> right. I just want to, uh, and I'm sure the other comments, just the, the, the concept of uh, interventions in, uh, in individual de designations. And, uh, and the commission has allowed it in the past, sometimes incredibly dramatic ones, and the one that comes to my mind is obviously the Hearst Building, which is uh, now I think everybody thinks it's like an, really an amazing building, but they did reflect, uh, if I, I wasn't here, but they spoke about the history of the building and the base and that it was intended to be a tower. I think if that argument, it has been partially actually presented by the applicants here in terms of where, um, where in fact the inspiration for this building was. But I, you know, I think you and I are saying very similar things that the the, the shape and form of any enlargement, based on the analysis that they've provided, hasn't been explored. And um, both in terms of looking at a hip roof, even if it's a, it's a modern interpretation of glass and something else, but in fact is in uh, the form that is like a federal hall, is something to explore. It would give you the height. It just, it's a bit, it is a departure from, I think, the concept that you come forward with it, forward now. I think the other possible way of working, if, if the metaphor of a turtle is what you would like to symbolize and incorporate in the building design. I mean, it's an interesting thing. Today, somebody will pass by that building and say, we don't know what that is. Five years from now, people will say, well, it is the turtle, and it's a, you know, it is Tammany. It's the same way that a designer says, you know, at some point they're designing something, and 10 years later, people are calling it the Gherkin building, the lipstick. I mean, I don't know if these names were there initially. so. Over time, that, that sort of recognition of the metaphor may become more apparent. But I think even if you choose that form, it seems that the treatment of the form and its shape vis-a-vis -vis the building is also, I think, not fully articulated. I think it's not clear to me. It's not a pure total form, for one thing. So it's, it's a morphed total form. Total form. And then, in its morphing, it, I don't think it's necessarily relating to the existing sort of architecture. So it just it feels that it's not there as yet. Um, yes, other comments? Yes, Michael and then Roberta. Um, first, I, I almost word for word agreed with the, uh, the assessment by the HTC representative. Uh, f for my own opinion, I'm one of the actually further to what Addy was saying, uh, if you take that, the diameter of the circle that you described on the building and move it within 
the parameters of the building itself, you get a much smaller dome, but you get a dome that allows you to save what I consider to be a significant uh, feature on this building, which is the faux slate hipped roof. Uh, in spite of the assertions that the, our own apparently assertion that uh, the that hip roof is a is a minor feature and hidden by the balustrade, it is absolutely not. It's one of the things that I notice every time I see that building. And and again, further to uh, Addie's discussion, uh, as far as I'm concerned, what the building needs to do to enhance its presence on this square is get rid of the garbage that is completely obscuring it from that corner of the block. Anyway, it's an individual landmark. I can, I can live with something on that roof, not something as egregiously large as this. Okay, uh, Roberta? Um, when you look at the, uh, uh, the rendering of the addition, um, which is what I saw before I saw the model, uh, it's, it looked like something that could be almost acceptable, but looking at the model and realizing uh, the proportions of the turtle, the roof, uh, uh, to the building uh, makes it really appear as if it is something that's out of scale, that, that, the, that the landmarked building base becomes the base for um, a new design. And it's not to say that there could not be anything, because I think that there could be a rationale um, for an addition on the roof, which I don't think we have, we have yet, because it's, it's not, you know, if there was an owner who needed a certain um, kind of a space who had this building uh, and came and said that they needed to build up, then I could but I think that um, we don't yet have that rationale for going to this extreme, and I think it uh, is extreme. And the fact that it is an individual um, landmark, I think, just sort of, for me, sets it at a higher bar, you know, so that um, really needs to be <laughs> a good, really good rationale for doing this. And, and I just think that this, if we did this, this would be too big. Okay. Uh, Chris? I just want to say that <clears throat> if it's this shell or another shell, I think in five years, people might look at the roof of this building and say, oh, that represents Turtle Island. That's what this whole America was once called. These people lived here for 12,000 years. And we really only remember the Dutch and the Africans and anybody who showed up since the 1600s. But they were living here for 12,000 years. I have to admit that uh, there are members of my family who think Chief Tamarin was a member of my family. I don't know that. But my mother was Lenape and uh, it's like a, it, this, I, th I would applaud the owner for even having the thought of doing this. We may not approve it, but there's more to this than just a silly idea of, oh, it's a turtle shell, it's a joke. 12,000 years to me is not a joke. Okay, understood, right, that this can be a real representation of, of uh, the community. Okay, understood, yes. Uh, I, I, <clears throat> I, would, um, I would say I think it's a very, very bold and ambitious pro uh, proposal. Um, I agree that this particular form uh, doesn't feel right on the building, but I think that I, I, I approach it um, in this way, I, I remember the designation hearings fairly recently, and I think that and my impression of them was that they were mostly focused on the cultural history of the building and not on the architectural history of it. So we, there are many land, individually landmark buildings that are designated for a variety of reasons. I, I don't recall this one being because of its unique architectural distinction, and, and that was actually echoed by some of the testimony uh, 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 Christabel, I think, was referring to that. You know. Yes, right. And um, I thought that, and I think that, that the roof, while a, a very visible feature uh, of the building, for me is not uh, its its essence. I think the the essence of the building is 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 its history, and and by removing the all the accretia, you you can kind of get back to that and re restoring the base, and its its formal relationship with the with the square. I think that that would significantly improve that. Um, so I do think that a, an, an addition of this scale can work on this building, can be appropriate on this building. I don't think that that needs to follow the lines necessarily 
of uh, the Mansard of the building's model. Um, uh, I, I think that the, the notion of a dome, I, I, share, I share Adi's trouble with, with this being called a dome. Um, it's kind of more of a draping over, uh, you know, over the uh, interior volume that's being added. Um, and I think that when I look at it, and, and when I'm trying to understand what bothers me about it and why I don't think that it's appropriate uh, for the building, I look at the examples that they showed of, of buildings where significant, very visible, very modern additions are made to historic buildings of varied uh, uh, ages and qualities and importance. And I think that what makes those work is a clear relationship between the new and the old. A, a kind of a, an imaginary line that you can make where you can see the new and the old and they relate to each other but they don't, uh, the relationship is clear and there's, an, there's a sense, there's, a, there's a, an attitude of, of the addition to the, to the original that's maybe something different as in Leon Opera. Um, it's a very different relationship from what was there um, but it, it's very clear and very, uh, very geometrically understandable. And uh, this form, by kind of draping, beh tucking behind the parapet in some places, lipping over it in others, and, and kind of surging at the center, it, it kind of feels very indeterminate, as you were saying, and very, uh, it doesn't quite relate to the base. It kind of just feels placed there. Um, uh, so I think that I think that by exploring the the design of the addition, not ne I don't think that one needs to be limited to to the to the hip form, although that could be interesting. But trying to kind of make the addition respond in a more simplistic way, straightforward way to the to the architecture of the base. Um, would be great, and I don't think that that necessarily precludes uh, integrating some of the the Native American imagery that that they were calling on. I just think it has to do with how you do that, and and the way it's detailed, and the relationship of of this new modern object to the object it sits on. Okay. Um, all right. I just I just want to comment on what you said. I think that uh, some of the examples that uh, were shown here today of other cities that uh, I think probably face challenges as we do in New York, which is how to mix the old with the new. Uh, I think of Berlin where they have the Reichstag and uh, the enlargement. It obviously has a lot of significance to that building and it's, uh, they put a roof which is modern and visible. And uh, so the idea of, of incorporating uh, new modern elements into um, into even our individual designations, and that being a bold step, I think New York can do it. If there's a city that should do it and think more broadly about uh, preservation, it's New York. So I think I would encourage commissioners to just think about that. And just on the issue of the corner on Union Square and its prominence. I agree, I think even by stripping this and just restoring the base uh, or the main portion of the building uh, would do a lot, but I think the idea of actually calling attention to this corner in an interesting architectural way uh, would be um, actually a wonderful thing. And if it can incorporate more <laughs> cultural aspects to the building and not just its architecture, that's even better because uh, this building does reflect, um, it does have a very, very strong uh, social cultural history and as Chris pointed that even by um, reference takes you back to, uh, as you said, 12,000 years. So, um, 12, yeah. so, um, so I think that for the team, there are many things to look at over here. I think clearly there's a, a, a broader question about I think this is general maybe appreciation by the commission that an enlargement may be appropriate. I think that shape and form can take many, actually can take many shapes and form, but I think it's for you to sort of explore how you want to do that hearing from our comments. Uh, but I think there's an overall comment about maybe trying to look at the proportions of that, of, of that enlargement. 
uh, as it relates to some of the arguments that you've made here, and also trying to see how that is more respectful to uh, the historic fabric. And while uh, I don't even mean just the historic fabric of the, the, the hip roof, but of the base. And so one comment that we've heard a lot from members of the public is that the idea that this just drops from the sky and places itself over here is, uh, is, has been said. So I think that the connection, I think, just needs to be explored more. So uh, I think we're looking forward to see what the next iteration is. Are there any other comments before we uh, close the hearing? Okay, good. So we'll close the hearing then. Thank you. And uh, we will have our lunch. Yes, a little longer.